This is Derek, and you're listening to Skepticality, the official audio program of Skeptic Magazine, for Tuesday, June 5th, 2012. <laughs> Welcome back to an episode of Skepticality, the show that features information, news, and interviews with scientists, skeptics, and anyone who loves to join us in our love of science. If you're going to send us your own science proclamation, please record yourself or any of your friends letting the world know how much you love science. Send those audio bits to us at hosts at skepticality.com. So while you run off and record your own science shout out, I will let Tim Farley give us his ongoing adventure into the past and future of skeptical thought. I'm Tim Farley of whatstheharm.net and skeptools.com, and this is Skepticism Past and Future. This week in the past, we've got connections and coincidences, and in the future, we've got the data mining of skeptical connections by Google. Many times during the years that I've been researching skeptic history, I've been struck by connections and coincidences that tie things together. They sometimes help us learn new things, and they certainly make this segment more interesting. Some are merely coincidences, like the fact that two notable people connected to Scientology were both born on June 17th. That would be L. Ron Hubbard's third wife, Mary Sue, who was born June 17, 1931, and Russell Miller, who wrote a biography of Hubbard called The Bare-Faced Messiah. He was born June 17, 1938. Another is the fact that seemingly universal concepts such as the word bunk or the idea of a placebo control actually have an identifiable birth date. I talked about the origin of the word bunk and bunkum in a particular speech in Congress back in February in Skepticality number 176. The modern concept of a placebo, and particularly its use as a control in drug trials, can be traced to Henry K. Beecher's 1955 paper, The Powerful Placebo. It was first presented at the 104th meeting of the AMA on June 7, 1955. Every time I add more information to my Skeptic History database, I find more connections and parallels like these. In the present, the World Wide Web builds much of its strength on connections in the form of hyperlinks. And as skeptics have adopted the web as a tool, They've built millions of hyperlinks that tie together critical analysis of claims with the claims themselves. Some of these links are on our own websites, and many are on general purpose websites such as Wikipedia. I've mentioned Wikipedia here before in Skepticality number 180, and I've blogged about it many times. I believe it to be very important to skeptic outreach. Recently, Google has introduced an enhancement to their search engine, that has a name only a computer programmer could love, Google Knowledge Graph. It mines these links in Wikipedia and elsewhere on the web to attempt to understand the connections between concepts and offer up summary results that aren't merely a regurgitation of keywords. The product is only available to U.S. users at this time, but already it is clear that it has significantly benefited from skeptic activity on the web. If you search for any of a number of prominent psychics, such as John Edward or Sally Morgan, you are now greeted with a picture of James Randi, where you wouldn't have been before. And a search for Brzezinski in reference to the Houston alt-med cancer doctor Stanislaw Brzezinski, brings up, among other things, a picture of Rhys Morgan, a young skeptic Welsh blogger who has criticized him. 
The skeptic influence here is a great example of why it is so important for skeptics to be active on the World Wide Web. Coming up next month at the James Randi Educational Foundation's Amazing Meeting 2012, I'll be leading a workshop on the future of online skepticism. I'll be talking about editing Wikipedia and other ways that skeptics can help build these information connections that help the general public learn about science. I hope many of you will join me there. My workshop is on Thursday, July 12th. And this brings us to the end of another edition of Skepticism Past and Future. Links to additional material are in the show notes. And follow me on Twitter or Facebook under the name Krelnik, K-R-E-L-N-I-K, for a daily fact from skepticism's past and ongoing news of skepticism's future. So now that you know a bit about what has happened and what might be happening, let us check into the master of encyclopedic knowledge, Bob Carroll. This is Bob Carroll, creator of the Skeptic's Dictionary and the blog Unnatural Acts That Can Improve Your Thinking. Welcome to another episode of Unnatural Virtue. In this and future episodes, I'll be offering some brief comments on topics in critical thinking, skepticism, and science. Today's topic is the ad hominem fallacy. Arguers use many tricks to avoid direct confrontation with arguments whose conclusions they disagree with. One favorite trick is to cast aspersions on the arguer one disagrees with and hope that any audience you have will make the mistake of taking your attack on a person as having merit in undermining that person's argument. If you lack a substantive reply to criticism, for example, attack your opponent's motives. I once criticized Rupert Sheldrake for discarding 40% of his data in a test of the psychic abilities of a parrot. He threw out the data because the parrot did not respond during those tests. If he had included the silent sessions where no ability, psychic or otherwise, was detected, the statistical results would have been quite different. Sheldrake responded publicly by claiming, Carroll is a committed skeptic who is strongly motivated to try and discredit the positively and statistically significant results of these tests which implies some form of unexplained communication between Amy and Inkisi, the parrot. Carroll has no scientific credentials, and he gets carried away by his strong beliefs and dogmatic zeal. His style of analysis is amateur and pretentious. His intentions are polemical. Whatever my credentials are or my intentions were, they are irrelevant to whether my criticism of Rupert for not counting 40% of the data he collected was justified. There are times when it is relevant to refer to a person's character, associations, occupation, hobbies, motives, mental health, likes or dislikes. It is reasonable and relevant to question the motives or character of someone who is testifying in court, for example. Testimony stands or falls on whether the claims made are believable, and that depends on the trustworthiness of the one testifying. Judges and jurors may draw conclusions based on testimony, but the one testifying is making claims, not arguments. The ad hominem fallacy has nothing to do with trying to undermine the credibility of a witness by providing evidence of his untrustworthiness. Testifying is not arguing. The ad hominem fallacy occurs only when one attempts to refute another person's argument by focusing on the arguer rather than the argument. For example, if I make an argument defending the claim that 9-11 was not an inside job by the Bush administration, but the work of a conspiracy by a group of Islamic jihadists associated with the international terrorist group Al-Qaeda, you do not refute my argument by making claims about me. It doesn't matter whether your claims are true. I may be a supporter of Bush's foreign policy. I may be an old man who wants to believe his pension is secure. I may not be an engineer or an explosives expert. But none of that matters when trying to refute my argument. To refute my argument, you must show that my evidence is insufficient, that it's based on false or questionable assumptions, that the evidence I present is irrelevant, that I've omitted important evidence, or that I've given improper weight to various pieces of evidence. An argument's cogency depends on the evidence presented for the claims defended, not on the character, associations, interests, motives, beliefs, or anything else about the person making the argument. 
It may be true that I'm a skeptic, an atheist, and a liberal, but none of those facts are relevant to whether any argument I make is a good one. Pointing out what one considers negative personal matters poisons the well. It suggests the argument is defective because the arguer is flawed. But even the most evil or stupid person in the world can make a good argument. It all depends on the premises presented and the conclusion defended. No argument ever became a good argument simply by putting it in the mouth of a good person. Nor has any argument become a flawed argument simply by being put forth by a flawed person. When attacking arguments, personal matters should be ignored. A favorite form of poisoning the well is to sprinkle value judgments throughout one's rebuttal. For example, oh, I can't believe they let you teach critical thinking. Your standards are so low that you're a danger to your students. Such claims are not of much value. They have no substance. All they reveal is that the one making them doesn't like your position. They offer no sense of what might be wrong with that position, and thus can't help you correct any errors if in fact you've made some. One of the more deceptive ad hominem attacks is to accuse another arguer unjustly of the ad hominem while making an ad hominem attack oneself. In response to criticisms I made of Stephen F. Hayward's analysis of the email stolen from the University of East Anglia's Climatic Research Unit, an anonymous critic wrote, Your defense of ClimateGate wandered off into ad hominem attacks on conservatives. Science is in trouble when your political beliefs determine your scientific opinion. A skeptic goes into denial when we need honesty. I had accused Hayward of being politically motivated, but I was not trying to refute his claims. Rather, I was trying to explain why he seemed not to care about the science at all, and why he might distort and exaggerate the material in the emails to fit his preconceived ideas about climate change and the scientists whose data support anthropogenic global warming. My critic either did not know or care that it is relevant to bring up a person's motives or character when trying to explain something he's done. Hayward titled his piece to include reference to a, quote, corrupt cabal of global warming alarmists, end of quote. That bit of poison in the well was a reference to the scientists who hold the consensus view regarding anthropogenic climate change. Hayward referred to the hacking and theft of the East Anglia emails as a, quote, document leak and recklessly speculated that the documents may have been leaked by a, quote, whistleblower from the inside. My real concern, though, was with Hayward's argument against the consensus view on climate change and his characterization of the stolen emails as revealing a conspiracy by corrupt scientists. I offered reasons for my criticisms. I didn't rely on my charge of his being politically motivated to make my case. Well, that's it for this episode of Unnatural Virtue. For more on the ad hominem and other fallacies of reasoning, check out the Skeptic's Dictionary and my blog, Unnatural Acts That Can Improve Your Thinking. In the meantime, please, commit some unnatural acts in public. And don't forget, skepticism, though unnatural, is a virtue. Thanks again, Bob. Well, our friends over at IIG West, who happen to be the same folks who do our next segment, you know them. They're the guys and lady who buck the odds to bring us a fun story each week. And we call it, well, you know what it is. And welcome to the Odds Must Be Crazy on Skepticality, where reason meets that nagging feeling that you knew something funky was going to happen today, but of course you didn't bother to tell anyone. I'm Wendy Hughes. And I'm Jarrett Kaufman. And we're here to read you a story and then talk too much about it. Hi, Jarrett. What story are we going to read our beloved, kind, and attractive listeners today? Hi, Wendy. Today's story was submitted to us by friend of the blog, Ross Blancher. You know him from the podcast Oh No, Ross and Carrie, and he created our awesome logo for us. This also marks the first story we're debuting simultaneously on Skepticality and our blog. You can find it there by searching for Surely You Can't Be Serious, and it's also linked to in the show notes. 
Ross's story begins. My extended family was enjoying its annual trip to Disneyland. While we typically go to celebrate my mom's birthday, this particular Saturday happened to fall on my niece Shirley's third birthday. She was the delightful recipient of many gifts and happy birthday wishes. You could be forgiven for thinking that Shirley is something of an older-fashioned name. She was named after my grandmother. We'd made dinner reservations at the Big Thunder Mountain Barbecue. As we arrived there, we heard a guitar-playing cowboy on the stage announce, Come on up here, Shirley. Let's all sing Happy Birthday to Shirley. Everyone in our party started looking at each other. Who told him? How do they know it's Shirley's birthday? As my brother-in-law walked Shirley toward the stage, we saw that another little girl was being escorted up in front of the crowd. Before my brother-in-law could say anything, another man yelled out from the crowd, Our daughter is Shirley too, and it's her birthday. Now we felt like we had to prove that our Shirley was really named Shirley and was also having her birthday because the coincidence was simply too amazing. Here we had three girls aged three, four, and five, each with a traditional name that is apparently all the rage, sharing the same birthday. All three Shirleys were serenaded by the crowd. It took a long time for my family to stop laughing. Ross's story about a family celebration at the happiest place on earth, the mental image of all the little Shirleys, was too adorable to keep to ourselves. So we shared it with our probability analyst, Barbara Drescher, for a reality check on how many Shirleys it takes to celebrate a birthday at Disneyland. We'll paraphrase for you here, but we recommend viewing the story on the site for her unedited thoughts. Barbara says, When we are in the midst of these experiences, they seem astonishing. But there are a great many factors to consider when calculating the odds of such a thing. Although I cannot estimate those odds without some basic information, such as the year in which this occurred, I think the list of factors will make it clear that the odds are greater than they appear. First, how unusual was the name Shirley at the time? Although Barbara concedes that it sounds old-fashioned, the popularity of baby names is an interesting animal with somewhat cyclical patterns. Sometimes the name is popular simply because it is widely assumed that it will be unpopular and people tend to seek uncommon names for their children. Shirley is considered uncommon according to several databases, including Babypedia, but it peaked at number two in 1935. Also, naming children after great-grandparents is a common practice. How many girls born in the last decade or two had great-grandmothers born during the name's heyday? What factors make the story less unlikely than one would expect? The number of people visiting Disneyland that day, how many young visitors to Disneyland that were celebrating a birthday, how many of the visitors were within earshot of the stage on which this occurred. Keep in mind that it was a popular park restaurant at dinner time. All affect the probability of the number of Shirley's at the same place with the same name and the same birthday. I imagine the park performers who do such things have many stories like this one. Still, it's fun and memorable when it happens to you because, although the odds are not shockingly low, it is uncommon. Perhaps if we polled the various employees, we might be able to pick up some interesting patterns and find this is extremely common. We might even get some additional insight into the popularity of various names. Regardless, it's a fun story and an amazing life experience for these young girls. They'll have to put up with enough Shirley jokes later in life. But for us, it was an opportunity to make an airplane joke in the title of the story. And that's all that really matters. Thanks for listening to The Odds Must Be Crazy on Skepticality. Be sure to visit theoddsmustbecrazy.com and share your comments, especially if they're not first or I can see the pixels. Also, be sure to follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, circle us on Google+, and validate us in life. Hit the Submit a Story link on our site to share your own crazy stories, or tweet the short ones with the hashtag T-O-M-B-C. The Odds Must Be Crazy is a project in collaboration with the Independent Investigations Group in Los Angeles, California. Visit them at iigwest.org. Barbara Drescher is a contributing editor to our blog and can also be found at icbseverywhere.com. Special thanks to our producer and sound engineer, Brian Hart. Our theme music comes to us courtesy of Mr. Deity himself, Brian Keith Dalton. You can find him at MrDeity.com. And until next time, remember, the white zone is for immediate loading and unloading of passengers only. There is no stopping in a red zone. The white zone is for immediate loading and unloading of passengers only. There is no stopping in a red zone. 
So I think it was about a month or so ago when a listener sent me a link to a cool science resource. It was an online resource that I found quite forward-thinking. It had the goal of providing educational materials to teachers, professors, and pretty much anyone who want to learn more about the real world and science. So I played around with their online tools and games, and I decided I had to have some time with the man behind Sponge Lab, Dr. Jeremy Friedberg, so he can tell us all about his vision and what might be considered the future of science education. So I'm here with Jeremy Friedberg. Is that how I say that? That That's great. That's perfect. All right. I wanted to make sure I had, had it right. So uh, he is the creator, founder of Sponge Lab. Yes. And tell people a little bit about what Sponge Lab is. As, as an organization, we're, we're a, a team of um, scientists, teachers, artists, animators, and programmers. And we come together to do some pretty interesting development. Uh, all of it is very much focused in, in sort of two areas. That's science and science communication, but also game-based learning and the, the application of game-based learning. And that really is, um, reaches right across disciplines. It's for anybody learning, for anything, anything you're, you're, you're trying to communicate. But as an, as an organization, we sort of wear three hats. And we do uh, a lot of custom production for, for the scientific community. And it's, it's, it's custom production, it's interactive production, but it's really about helping communicate science to different group, groups of audiences and, and really developing some amazing interactives to do that. The, the sort of the second area that, that SpongeBob um, works is in our own, our own development, which includes content production. We produce a lot of our own content, but we also produce a lot of um, engine technology to deploy that content and platform technology to help stitch that content into the fabric of a variety of different environments. And specifically at the SpongeBob.com site, how to stitch digital media into um, the fabric of the, of the education system. And so the third area that we, we spend a lot of time in is in research. And we have an active research program with a number of um, academic, academic institutions. And we really study the use of, of digital media and the efficacy of using game-based learning. Because I noticed uh, you, so your website is spongelab.com. Yes. And there's a lot of resources there. And so basically what your company, your group is doing is giving people... Um, resources to, for educators as well as just personal learning. Absolutely. And what, there's a couple things we've, we've been studying. And literally, I started doing this kind of stuff um, as a graduate student. And, and I really, this journey began back in 2003. But in, in that time, we've really been trying to understand the the true nature of what's going on in learning environments. And by, by environments, it don't just mean computer systems, but you know, what's happening in these, these different types of environments? How is it, how are things happening in a classroom as we traditionally understand it? How does it change when you're at home? What are the different sort of needs and problems that are going on in this, in this environment? And you know, one of the, the first major things that SpongeLab set out to tackle is, is deployment. And as yes, you can imagine, we and people joke about this anecdotally, but you know, there's this massive spectrum of technologies and levels of technologies out there to, to access uh, digital content, and we have to, to be able to design for all of them. And so, when we first sat down to build our first educational games, we were really thrust with a problem of. You know, how do I take a gig and a half of content and stuff it on a pretty crummy computer with a meager internet connection? <laughs> and you know, really, it was, it was this. In, we still tackle that even to, even today. But we sent out to, we spent about two years building a, a, an engine, a, a deployment engine that basically can let us send that content in that way. And you can even use our platform on dial-up. Its first use is not fabulous, but it's still we have that accessibility because we are. It's important to make make sure we're, we're equitable and access as best as we can. And so, I mean, that was one of the first major hurdles we tackled. And then once we, we achieved that, we started to turn our attention to the, the problems of using, like what are the real issues with using digital media? And some of them are, are pedagogical. I'm not in the, in the sense of curriculum, but um, they're pedagogical and they're also fiscal. And from a pedagogical perspective, you know, 
single-handedly the biggest issue we have is, you know, that your game is cool. I get it. It's really kind of, it's, it's amazing, but you know, what do I do with it? I, I exist in this framework of education. And it's in, education is very much an institution. And there's a lot of stuff that is there and very rigid in a structure. And we can't pretend to try and change that. And what we have to do is develop a platform to help integrate, stitch it all together, both digital experiences, physical experiences, um, animations, textbooks, um, laboratory experience, field trips, the social experience of being in a classroom versus the, the, the more solitary experience of being at home and how to bring it all together. And this platform is really the tool set that has been lacking. And it, it's there to help make digital media effective within the framework of, the educa- of education. Now, I notice on your website is, like I said, is for educators and people who want to learn on their own. And I noticed that because you can, if you're an educator, you can create lessons and package them up for yourself. And then if you wanted to, there's, like you said, there's games. A new game you came out with, it's Dragon Base, and who doesn't like dragons? So (laughs) obviously that's why you use that. And then there's like puzzle games and things like that. So what do you envision as the typical user of your resources on the website? Um, the nice thing about it is that there, there really isn't a typical user. And it's one of the things we found, even if you were to say, okay, teachers as a group of users, even amongst them, I mean, everyone's doing different things with the platform. And they, everyone has very, very different needs. And the, the site is designed to be flexible to everyone's needs. So just to highlight that, you know, the vast majority of teachers um, looking for digital resources, digital new resources are going. Do you know the top two places are? Can you imagine? I, off the top of my head, no. Uh, Google Images and YouTube. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, it's like we all have that kind of that, that visceral reaction. It's like I need something I need it now, and Google tells me everything I need. But when you're trying, now, when it comes to trying to find resources you're going to be using to teach with, you have to wade through all of the garbage to find anything good. And once you found it, is it valid? Am I allowed to use it? And then how do I use it? Am I downloading it? Or do I put it in a presentation? Give it to, how do I get it to my students? And so the whole process of just finding content falls apart at that level. And so the first part of this platform, just for, for many users, just about finding content. It's like a place you can come to get stuff. And the platform is completely open and free, and I can certainly expand about how we do that. But you know, you can come to the Explore page, and you can just browse for content. So if you search for animal, you'll, it'll give you all the images. It'll, it'll break it down by category. So on that Explore page, it's got that kind of expanding accordion. So it shows you here all the images, the, uh, the games and simulations, the animation and video, case studies, lesson plans, and, and also um, you know, e- e-books, e-textbooks. And it also uh, shows you science-related products. So if you were to, let's say you were to search for DNA as a teacher, you know, it gives you back to the images, the animations, the game simulations, and oh, here's a DNA extraction kit that I can be using with my students. So it shows you all the content, but how to connect all the other related types of content. And even as you pull up a profile of, of an asset in the system, you know, it gives you a nice thumbnail, you can see it in high res, and you can save as, take it away, and use it however you want. But it gives you a vetted description, connect uh, the ability to find all the related materials associated with it, and then it starts to align into physical resources. So like right now, we have a lot of textbooks aligned in there. So if you see this image, this is a great image, I want to use it. It shows you, well, if you happen to use this publisher's book, here's the book, and it goes great with these four chapters. So it's a first and an important connection on, well, I already have this book in my classroom. Here, how do I use that animation with this book? And then the site in one step shows it all to you. So... How did you uh, come to want to found this company? Um, a lot of this came out of my own experiences as a teacher. And, you know, as a graduate student, I, you, you do a lot of teaching. And I, it was something I always enjoyed. I loved it. But in, in my early days, I was really awful at it. And I really just wanted better tools to help get my students excited about about science and it excited about and in the, in the case of that course my very first course was genetics and that's where really, that's where the, the was the genesis of this whole thing and so it really started to build from there so you were a teacher of genetics yeah i mean as a graduate student i taught a lot of different courses from you know um, second year biology to genetics 
And then, you know, as I as I graduated from from my doctor program, I taught at a number of, of universities in Canada and taught everything from um, intro biology to a cell biology and applied cell biology and and molecular genetics. That would explain the dragon game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dragon breeding is an interesting, a very interesting game, and yeah, it, I'm trying to understand and even get excited about Mendelian genetics is is somewhat. Um, uh, dare I say a challenge uh, and then dragon breeding was very much to take a, a mainstream pop culture theme and create a world around it that's based on, on specific rules and let people play through the, the world and, and, and experience what those rules are like any good game does yeah it's, it's more more focused on the genetic part than the spore was supposed to be like that but it really ended up yeah. not being that yeah, yeah. but this is more about the genetic part than than the uh, other option was and I think that was a good idea oh thanks um, it, it was an interesting game and there was a lot of people who got involved with it and, and, and incidentally on a, a technical note it was our it was our four, first fully HTML5 game that we, we've ever developed and for us internally it was very much a proof of concept and, and trying to test the limits of what HTML5 is and what it can do and sort of how it fits into the landscape of hardware, infrastructure and networks in, in today's climate. Yeah, and it worked out pretty well. Well, thanks. So, so like I said, I noticed a lot of the, uh, the content on the website currently is biology and Oh no! It, it's it's actually there's 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 quite a mix now. Um, if you were on the site about six months ago, it was it was sort of swayed biology in a biology focus, but it's not anymore. It's it's really cross discipline. We've stuff from all over the place, and the way we're able to do that is the SpongeBob platform is an open community driven platform. So we have contributors, people contributing content from a variety of organizations and groups, and and the content. Um, the contents in there are spanning everything. So if you're, if you're interested in physics and chemistry, there's tons of stuff there. Let's say I'm a teacher and mm-hmm. I come here to like find information. What do I have to do to use this information in my class teachings? Well, I mean, really, I mean, if you're your first time on the platform, um, it, it can be a little bit overwhelming. And so, I mean, that's why we have these on the, on the landing pages. We have these, these four major cards that we call them. You know, the first one sort of gives, you, gives everyone a sense of what's going on in the community. The second one takes you right into the first step for most people coming to the website is I just need to find content. So you can either just browse for it or search for it. And you can look at the featured content, which is the third card. And that's sort of a listing of some of the, some of the key major um, bits of content that you know, you really might want to check this out. And then we, the last card is our site tour, which is a sort of a, an ever-changing and ever-evolving um, helper to help you understand the depth of the platform. Because what this platform is there to do is to, to carry a teacher and, and, or anybody using this through the process they need, the complete process of the use of content. So it's not just about finding it, because you can find lots of amazing content out there. The biggest problem is not, I need more content, it's just, what do I do with what I have? So the tool set built in here helps carry you from finding content, then helping you organize it, and then you can customize it. You can annotate it so you can personalize it for yourself or particular groups, and then you can use it as in, in multiple ways that a teacher might use content, and then you can deploy it to users, uh, you know, specifically your students. And then once your students are using the content, the system is tracking an unbelievable amount of data and distilling that data back to you so you can truly understand what the engagement is like. Um, how are they using the content? What's working? What's not working? Um, what is the digital learning culture that's going on in my, in my groups? Is there, is, there, is there differences? Are they doing what I think they're doing? Um, what technologies are they using? And really, truly understanding things like critical thinking, creativity, being able to run formative and summative feedback. And so the data is really there as the final component to this to help truly understand, am I doing what I think I'm doing? And how are, how are the groups that I'm responsible for doing? And so it's really been a complete package that it's the tool set to actually deal with the, just the process of content. And the platform is not designed to replace learning management systems. In fact, it was designed to work with them. And so this plugs into your LMS system. Like LMS systems are great for the, the administration of the education process. This is about dealing with the interaction with content. Because you have 
online games, and you also have things that are coming out for Android and iPad as well. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the site itself is an HTML5 compliant site. The framework of the site will run on any device. And the, the only restrictions we currently have is with the iOS platform that, that many of our, our games are still Flash content. We're slowly converting that over. Um, but, I mean, we have tons of students who use our platform on, on iPads, and it, it works beautifully. And the nice thing about the platform, because of the way it structures um, content allows you to, to work with content, you can share it with content amongst each other. So, I mean, when you create, so, you know, after the explore page, you, when, you find, when you find stuff, you can add it to my list. You know, it's like a, play, like a, a playlist of content. And then you define unique subsets of that list. We call them lessons, but... Our, in, in, the, in the framework of our platform, a lesson is a clustering of content for a particular purpose. So that can be that traditional purpose of there's the content cluster for day one, day two, day three, day four. But we have, it can be, you know, this is a, a cluster of content for preparation for the lab or for a field trip. Or this is stuff for Jeremy because he was sick for two weeks and, and um, you know, it's just stuff for him to get him caught up where he needs to, to um, anywhere he needs to be. But so we have within our community both this tr- traditional method of you know, teachers clustering content and delivering it to students, but we have tons of students who are clustering content of their own and sharing it with each other, and then even both teachers and parents joining those clusters to see how they're communicating interacting with content. So it's, it's incredibly flexible and dynamic, but allows for that kind of social integration with content. And, you know, I, I'm a huge supporter of the, the idea of, you know, tablets in schools, but I'll be devastated if they go into schools just so people can read digital textbooks. The real, I mean, the real power of it is we're going to connect you together in a way you never can connect. We can collaborate in learning. We can be social in our learning. And it's a very powerful and an exciting opportunity. So what has been some of your biggest success stories of people using the, uh, your flat platform? Um, right now, uh, we, we have an active user, monthly user base, about 50,000 users on our site a month using our, our platform, and our users are coming from 151 countries. It's been really exciting. We've delivered over, over 1.5 million pieces of content out to that community, uh, and, and we're sort of growing at a rate of around 40% a month, which has been really exciting. And... Um, We've also been getting, in terms of our content development, we've been getting a lot of international recognition. Um, you know, and some of this stuff dates way back, but some of our earlier games won a World Summit Award from the United Nations. This is back in 2009. Um, and there was a competition over 22,000 of the other digital learning um, um, applications out there. And most recently, we won an award and recognition from the, the National Science Foundation and was published in... Uh, for an application called Build a Body, which was published in the Journal of Science. And it was actually our third time being published in the Journal of Science uh, for our content. And it's been really exciting for, for, for myself and my team to get that kind of international recognition. Um, and just along the lines of Build a Body, um, it's a neat application. You can certainly check it out. It's on the future content list. But it was an application where it's very simple. It's not very much a game in the traditional sense, but it is, well, you have to assemble bodies. You build, assemble organ systems, put those systems into a body, hope that you get it right, and then things start to go wrong with your body, and then you've got to figure out how to fix it. It was a kind of a, an interesting take on understanding anatomy, uh, human anatomy, but we've seen some interesting pickup from that in our community. And for the feedback coming in, and we was designed for high school and intro college university students, but we've, get, we've gathered a following of four- and five-year-olds, and we get emails from parents um, saying their kids love this. And it's been really interesting, and we've been asking questions of, well, what's going on there? Well, it doesn't surprise me. My first book when I was a kid actually was Grey's Anatomy. My mom always finds that entertaining. Yeah, it's yeah, – it's, I mean, I have, I have a four-year-old daughter who could not put the application down. And, you know, the, there seems to be this historical de- design convention that, you know, to, to, to teach the little kids, you need the fluffy bunny and the pink elephant. And, but, you know, she's so curious. You know, she knows stuff goes in and stuff comes out. And, you know, she wants to see all the, the, the plumbing that's in between and, and what it looks like and its, and its richness. And it, it doesn't phase her and it gets her really excited. So it's, it's, it's been interesting to say this. Yeah. And so, I th- see, a lot of times I get feedback from listeners that are – teachers or they're in the education you know arena and a lot of people always ask 
where can I get more content for younger people or people that are, isn't as dry as the typical thing? And then when I saw this platform, I was like, you know, I had to get, get you on because I think this is another really good resource for especially uh, people who want to teach their kids or, or they teach kids about science or critical thinking all that stuff is here on the site and it's you can go get it and it's it's very low barrier of entry if you have web browser and you can go look at it yeah you, you, that's it that's it is it exactly it's free you need a browser and an internet connection and it doesn't even have to be a great one you can still i mean the experience is not fabulous but you can still use it on dial up but i mean along those points i mean when you go to the explore page i mean you can refine by language by subject you know, browse by thumbnail, but th- there's also something on there in each, there's a column in the, as you look at content called level. And one thing you'll notice is that we don't label things by grade. And that was done very intentionally. We, we, there's a lot of internal debate about this, uh, but you know, labeling something by grade completely pigeonholes it because what's appropriate for one grade A class is completely inappropriate for another grade A class. And even individuals, I mean, the, the grade level doesn't do it justice. And so, you know, to say build a body, as an example, is for, you know, grade 11 and 12 students. You know, somebody who is looking for content for little kids would completely discount that. And so we, we, we're, we are actively looking at, you know, what, what does that mean and, and how do we communicate this? But you're absolutely right. And people can come here from anywhere and find all kinds of resources. What you do with it is up to you and most teachers, they, they use their experience in knowing the, the capacities of their students to choose what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. It's more of a uh, explore for people who are curious about, you know, everything. And I think it's a good thing because a lot of educational uh, mm-hmm. content is always put into the pigeonholes of grades. And I think that your de- de- decision not to do that was probably a good one. Well, thanks. Well, time will tell. <laughs> Well, it sounds like you have a good growth curve, so that's that's good. What is your best suggestion for where, a, like, a teacher could start? Because we got a lot of teachers listen to our show, and I noticed you had a lot of really good critical thought and uh, skeptic-based stuff on your lessons. You had a, a video about uh, intelligent design and how all the arguments against it are against evolution were pretty false and there's a really long uh, video showing pretty much how it came about and that was great I actually shared that with a couple of my friends who are skeptics and they they really enjoyed it so a lot of that stuff is very critical thought oriented even though you might not notice it because you never say it on the website (laughs) Absolutely. I mean, and that's and one of the things that, you know, there's some, the game content is very, is very, very diverse. And so, I mean, you know, images, are, you know, they're images and there's lots of beautiful things on there. Some labeled, some, it's, it's pretty standard stuff in, in utility and most people get it immediately when they see an image. Yeah, I can use that. I see how that works. Video is, a, you know, is another, another level up and there's all different, you know, types of video and we have everything from real laboratory research to you know videos that deal with overviews of particular topics but when you get into game content there's a very very diverse spectrum and they are and they were designed very specifically for the utility they were designed to go after so if you go to the the um you know the the feature content page um you can get off the landing page you'll see some things that are interesting so one is called you know right at the bottom of the list is one of our older games called transcription hero and Transcription Hero is is a very popular game. It's the only. It's one of our only games. It's a download, uh, and it's a download because as you play locally on your computer, you can plug your Guitar Hero controller into it. So the idea behind this game is that you're the enzyme RNA polymerase, and you have to copy or transcribe DNA. And so you're riding along the rails of DNA. It feels very much like a roller coaster ride. And you, as the as the nucleotides come down at you, you know we coded each key on the guitar to a different nucleotide. And, you know, so you, you're playing transcription. You're actually the enzyme. You're racing against the real enzyme. You're trying to do it better and faster. So this is a, a, a complete casual game. It's somewhat of a homage to, uh, you know, Guitar Hero. But it's, 
it, it is there for a very particular utility. I mean, transcription, we're not dealing with the mechanics of it. What we're dealing with sort of the higher level concepts of why students would be interested in it is that these molecular machines are incredibly fast. If, it was, if I, the enzyme was as big as me, it'd be moving at over 100 miles an hour, and it has an error rate of one and a half a million. They're pretty impressive. And part of the, the core of the game, <clears throat> excuse me, is that nobody can beat the native enzyme. It's moving incredibly fast. And you know, these are kind of the higher level concepts the game was designed to communicate while listening to whatever local music you have on your computer. And you're also playing real DNA sequences. So it draws data right out of GenBank and you're playing real DNA. And so we have games like that that are really fun, casual style games with limited utility. And it's important to recognize that. I mean, another game that we created and released this year called Biochem Gems, you know, is very similar to Bejeweled as a, as a game framework. We just made our jewels look like the, you know, the, one of the four basic, um, you know, molecules of life. So carbohydrates, nucleic acids, amino acids, and fatty acids. And we added a leveling feature to it. So instead of just matching three, four, and five, you actually have to construct things. So you actually have to make sucrose, maltose, um, cellulose, Lactose. You have to make certain base pairs. And really, this is a game that's dealing with some of the global concepts of biochemistry is that, you know, all life uses these basic building blocks, and all they do is make polymers out of them. And so you get experience with that in a very engaging way. Now, other games um, are completely at the opposite end, you know, where build a body, and there's a whole series of buildings, like build a frog, fish, worm, frog, tree, and it goes on and on. Um, those were game-based simulations, but then there's a game like History of Biology, and I encourage you to look at the trailer. It's pretty impressive, but this is a game that's built kind of like a web scavenger hunt, and it's got a long amount, a large amount of gameplay, and it's designed to be played over an entire semester. But we sat down to deal with some of the core issues of science, and one of the things that's always bothered me about science is that you, know, the public has this perception that science is completely black and white. It gives you the right and wrong answer, and that's the way it is. But it's really not that way. And the game was, the game was designed to deal with, the, yes, the, the science, the discoveries, but also the political and social issues at the time and how that influenced the people doing the work that they were doing. It's built on an incredibly rich storyline. It was a beautifully crafted game. And it's built kind of like a web scavenger hunt. So you have things that are happening inside the game interface, and you have tools, and you, you're going a series of 14 missions. But to solve these missions, you have to do your own research. And you go out into the, the, into the internet to do your own research. And what you encounter are both real websites, like museum sites, government sites, fake websites we planted, like art galleries, auction houses, and certain, and certain blogs, and real websites that are hosting fake content for us. And it's kind of this blended reality experience, but it's a fully investigative approach. You have to discover the solutions for yourselves. And the whole storyline is really about not just the science, but everything from ethical issues to political and social issues on how that affected the people historically, but how it's affecting us right now. And the game actually ends about a couple of years into the future, and we're on the cusp of some pretty major breakthroughs. Yeah, and I, I love that concept where using the the entire internet as a game because you planted some things where you wouldn't expect them. Yeah, and there, one of the one of the major international genetic databases has been gracious enough to be hosting a fake page for us. So it looks like a page of their database, but it's got it's got additional content in it for our game. Um, I, I, I don't want to spoil it for your listeners, but it, it is it is part of that. And you know, one of the reasons they are hosting us, they they really believe in the, in the concept of what this game tries to do, and it really it uses story in a very powerful way to engage the user and tell a really compelling compelling story. Like as an example, I, I guess I can sort of spoil this for you, but like in the first mission. Um, you know, you deal, you end up finding this, this gold coin that ultimately leads you to a guy named Zacharias Jansen. I'm not going to spoil the mission for you, for your listeners, but you know, what's interesting about Zacharias Jansen or Jansen, the, I'm, I'm, um, the dialect you're speaking in, um, is that you know, if you open up a biotech book, he'll, you know, Jansen is credited with developing one of the first microscopes in 1616, and that's where it ends. But what I find interesting about Jansen is that he was originally an eyeglass maker. His shop happened to be located next to a mint, 
Um, he used to collect rare coins and used to make coins. He just made a hell of a lot of coins that looked like regular coins and landed himself on trial for counterfeiting. He was eventually convicted of counterfeiting and given the death sentence for it, but he was able to skirt the gallows because everyone in the court was on his payroll. It's an awesome story, and I love it. Not that I'm condoning counterfeiting, but what I love about it is that, you know, he's not this monolith of science that you know, people often seem to think of, science, you know, the historic scientists are. You know, he's a regular, flawed human being like the rest of us. He had motivations and drives, and you can ask questions, well, why might he have been counterfeiting? Well, maybe the microscope business wasn't very good in 1660, but it opens the dialogue for students to talk about ethics, human psychology, political and social issues, and address it all the way up, because it, it never stops. We're still dealing with these issues all the time, even today. Well, it, it's a lot of times this, this happens where, like the story of the microscope you just mentioned, but you look at things like Scope's Michael tri- monkey trial, everything Absolutely. holds that up, but people forget the, the, science, the side of science kind of lost, and everybody forgets that. Yep. And, you know, like the guy who was put on, you know, trial for the death sentence because, you know, he was a counterfeiter. But it's the same idea where a lot of times we don't realize the rich history of science. Yeah. And, the, I mean, the other nice side of that is, I mean, because of the historical perspective of the game, it, you know, it blends together mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, um, history, um, Politics, it brings so many different disciplines together and, and gives you a, a phenomenal experience. But again, that's, an, a, that's a much more involved game, but the benefits of what it can do are pretty, are pretty, are pretty amazing. Well, like you said, some of these games actually are supposed to be played over the course of an entire semester. Yeah. You can do it in one sitting, we don't restrict that, but because of the way the missions are designed and the way the, the, sort of the content unravels itself, you uh, and this is we have guides that we help teachers to understand what they can do with it. You can play it out in a weekly um, in a weekly scenario so that you can deal with the game content, but also to have time to deal with the issues that come up with it. So let's say I am a educator and I have content that they want to that I want to uh, produce and become part of your platform. Can I do that? Absolutely, and so on the on, if you go to your lot, if you create an account, which again is free and open, um, you go to your my profile. There's a contribute content section, and right now we you can only contribute content in a couple of ways. So you can you can create lesson plans for us, case studies, submit a video link, and submit image links. Um, and so you know if you're making your content cluster, but you really needed that image of the giraffe, you can go to submit an image. And it actually will help you pull it out of the, the Wikimedia Creative Commons. And one of the things that our platform does, and this is a lot of behind the scenes, is we have an extensive QA process. So as any content that goes on the site is, is really checked for uh, validity, it's, it's accurately described, it has proper utility, but it's also its digital rights ha- have, been, have been managed. And so right now we only allow um, open users to freely submit through the Creative Commons. But if you have your own personal content, you can submit it to us directly and we give you full credit for it. And so as it goes up onto the site, it gets shared with the community at large and you, you'll see the logo attribution will change to you and any specific attributions. We do that already. We have a lot of scientists. We even have students who are cr- uh, contributing content and it's all credited back to them. And it's part of the, the, the community development is to encourage and foster this culture of creation and sharing. Very cool. So tell people again where they can find all this great stuff. SpongeLab.com. Um, you just, uh, uh, or just do a search for SpongeLab. It should pretty much take you to us. And you just um, register an account. It's open and free, and away you go. Great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. I encourage anyone who's involved in science education or outreach to check out the free tools and resources at SpongeLab. And if you're a parent or someone who needs materials or information for kids or people of all ages, what they have going on over at SpongeLab might be exactly what you're looking for. You can find out a link to that and everything else you heard here at the show notes at skepticality.com. Hungry. 
ready for more skepticism? Want to learn the truth about the scientific controversies of our time? Then subscribe to Skeptic, the quarterly magazine Stephen Jay Gould called the best journal in the field. To subscribe, visit Skeptic.com today. Thank you.